I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity It's great to be here uh, like Tucker said, uh, my background, I was an analytical chemist for several years after I graduated my undergrad. I decided to switch fields, so I went back to grad school, got my degree in molecular cell biology at UConn. There I studied muscle regeneration. Um, so I had a lot of uh, experience growing muscle in a dish, not to eat per se, but to understand the genetic factors behind it, what causes it and whatnot. Um, as this field was blossoming in you know, mid-2013, 2014, 2015, I learned about it. And I decided that this would be a great opportunity to put my domain knowledge to use as opposed to just working for like a big pharma company or something that doesn't really use my domain knowledge that I learned. Um, so I'm happy to be here to talk about cultured meat. I joined New Age Meats in January of this year and I became the Director of Biological Research. We are located or we're in the process of moving from San Francisco to Northwest Berkeley and we are hire hiring. So if you're interested in work, please come see me after this. Um, so my, our topic is cultured meat, but you know really Let's talk about meat in general. What is meat when we think about it? Well, if you go to the European Union, they have, have a uh, standard of identity of meat being skeletal muscle with connective tissue. The, that doesn't really capture everything when we talk about meat, you know. Hamburger, that's true. Tripe, not so much because tripe is more smooth muscle as opposed to skeletal muscle. Uh, head cheese, foie gras, again, that's not skeletal muscle and so forth. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about meat in terms of skeletal muscle. When you see a, a big slab of steak here, skeletal muscle is the main component, but it also has connective tissue and adipose tissue, or fat. The fat is in the white here, and the connective tissue is supposed to be kind of a white color, but you can't see it as well in this gross picture. Now, skeletal muscle itself is a complex and heterogeneous tissue. Here we got a cartoon diagram of a skeletal muscle fiber. Uh, both of those are skeletal muscle fibers here. These long cells here are skeletal muscle fibers. These are some of the largest cells in the body. Some of them can run from your hip to your knee, so as opposed to uh, other cells. Nerve cells are also very long, but other cells tend to be a lot smaller. They're also multinucleated and they have a great potential for regeneration, meaning that they can heal after injury fairly well. And that's what, we're, that's what we use in the culture meat field to, uh, to grow them in the dish. But skeletal muscle also has other, other tissues in it, or other uh, cells in it. It has vasculature, where the blood flows. It has various uh, uh, stem cells, the satellite cell, which is the muscle uh, stem cell that can make muscle. It has other, other connective tissue and so forth. So skeletal muscle is very complex tissue. But in the culture meat field, we don't really need to get to this level of complexity when we want to sell a product or make a product. Um, but meat, skeletal muscle, that's the message of the slide. Um, <coughs> now what is cell cultured meat? Well, cell cultured meat, also known as cell-based, lab-grown, cultured, or uh, cultivated meat, probably going to have a new name next week as well, refers to meat created through cell culture and tissue engineering from animal cells and animal slaughter. So the basic steps are shown here in this particular diagram from New Harvest. What you can do is you can take a biopsy of a live animal. You can do a local anesthetic of the animal or just knock it out completely. Take a small biopsy, maybe about this big, you don't need that much tissue. You uh, hurry back to lab and then you uh, isolate the cells. You have to treat it certain ways mechanically with certain, uh, also with certain enzymes to digest the tissue. Then you get the stem cells out of it. The stem cells are what you want. The stem cells can divide and create more stem cells, but stem cells can also make adult mature tissue. These are adult stem cells I'm talking about, not like embryonic or anything like that. As adults, we all have stem cells. So some of these stem cells you can culture, give it a special broth called uh, culture media. And then you let them grow, grow, grow. And ideally, you want to put them in something called a bioreactor. So you go from a two-dimensional culture dish to a three-dimensional bioreactor to take advantage of the extra volume here. Once you get a certain density, once you have a certain number of cells, you differentiate them. And that, what does that mean? That means you make these stem cells become mature adult cells. In our case, skeletal muscle cells, those really long fibers, and uh, also fat those big globby uh, uh, cells that are kind of white or brown that give a lot of texture and taste to meat. And then once you differentiate those cells, you can harvest them and then use food science to, and food processing to make them into hamburger or ground beef or ground pork or what have you. This is it in a nutshell. These are the first products being made are gonna be those probably of the ground minced product because they're so much easier than uh, than like a thick piece of steak or what have you, but I'll talk about that in a moment. So why, would, why, would, why do we care about this? Why would we even make cultured meat, right? You can go to any farm in California or around the world and get yourself some meat from an animal. 
Well, that's because industrial animal agriculture is both good and bad. Um, uh, our ancestors, you know, people around the world even now, would love to be in a position where we are in terms of meat consumption. I can go into a safe way. I, actually, I go to Lucky 13s. I go to Lucky 13s and I can go to the uh, meat aisle and I can get a pack of sausage for like six dollars. A hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, even in places in the world right now, they'd be love to have that opportunity to get that much abundance of meat that easily and for that cheaply. However, there's a problem, right? Industrial agriculture has its uh, downside as well in terms of animal welfare, uh, climate change, and being able to keep up with Earth's growing population. We're about 7.5 billion today, projected to be about 10 billion in 2050, and the appetite for meat is only growing as countries become more prosperous. And what do I mean by that? So uh, here's an example I just mentioned. So this is a graph from Pew. You can see uh, on the x-axis you got the year, and y-axis you get the percent of disposable income spent on meat. Here in the, in the U.S. particularly. So back in the 70s, people were spending about 4 to 5 percent of their uh, disposable income on meat. And this price has gone down through, um, through both increased animal production, uh, we've gotten more efficient at generating meat from the same number of cattle per se, but also that Americans have gotten wealthier as well. Um, so people are spending a lot less on meat. So this is a plus for industrial animal agriculture, right? They're very good, they're very good at making a lot of meat. And you can see that American consumption of meat has gone up as well. This is a uh, per capita meat consumption in the U.S. Kilograms in the y-axis, a year in the, on the x-axis. Back in the 60s, Americans on average ate about uh, 160 or so, 170 kilograms per person per year, which is a lot of meat. And it's only gone up over the years, right? We're at about uh, two, almost 225 currently, that kilograms per person per year that in America we're eating. Other countries, some other countries are a little higher, like Denmark, but most countries are much, much lower than this. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, not only America, but also the world meat consumption is increasing. Again, we have the years in the x-axis and the kilogram per capita kilograms in the y-axis. You see, this is worldwide, it's gone from about 25 kilograms of total meat, poultry, pig meat, uh, beef, and so forth, up to about 42 kilograms per person. Now, you know, an American's eating 220 kilograms, so some countries are getting very little to nothing, but in the, overall it's trending up, right? And are we going to be able to keep up with this increased demand in meat? You can see that pig meat is, uh, pig meat and poultry kind of make up the vast majority. Beef has kind of stayed steady, beef and buffalo. Now, um, and this agriculture can require a lot of land. Uh, this is a graph again from the same, uh, using the um, uh, our world data from the uh, Clark and T Tillman paper from 2017. They estimated how much land use per gram of protein by food type. And they found that beef uh, was by far the largest amount of land used to generate a uh, gram of protein, well, about, one, about one meter squared here. Pork is about 0.3, fit, fresh produce 0.1, so forth and so on. So we use a lot. We can use a lot of land to generate this much beef. And as the demand goes up, are we going to be able to keep up in the uh, countries that become more uh, more wealthy, like in China, in India? Are we going to be able to keep up the production to give those people meat as they become wealthier? <coughs> Not only that, but also pollution. So industrial animal agriculture and one life cycle analysis study where they look at the uh, inputs and outputs of um, meat versus cultured meat, they found that uh, cultured, uh, cultured meat or cultivated meat would use 5% of the gas emissions of traditional animal agriculture, 4% of the water usage, 1% uh, of the land usage, which we saw previously, they can use a lot of land, especially for beef production, and uh, zero antibiotics, so it was much less antibiotics. In the, e in the EU, uh, to be fair, in the EU I believe they don't use antibiotics in their life livestock, but in the US they still do. Now the problem with antibiotic usage, overusage, is there's potential for superbugs to develop because of antibiotic resistance uh, and bacteria. And these superbugs can cross over to humans, uh, whether through consumption or because humans and animals can be so intertwined sometimes when you're raising livestock. That's a very, very bad thing. Many people die every year because of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. Now I want to point out this is only one life cycle analysis. Uh, I am in the industry, but we don't have a um, no one has a pilot facility yet. None of the companies have a pilot facility, so I'll take these, these numbers kind of with a grain of salt in a way, and we'll find out the exact comparison between a traditional 
uh, industrial agriculture and culture big meat once we start the factory and once we can actually get the real numbers as opposed to estimates here. But right now it's looking good for culture meat in terms of less pollution and being able to uh, uh, generate uh, meat as well. Um, now, so not only this, but one thing that's very recent in pork, which is what uh, New Age Meats focuses on, is there's been a lot of trouble in the pork industry with African swine fever. This is a uh, fever that can affect pigs. It causes them to lose weight and it has a very high mortality rate. Uh, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but they tend to, the pigs tend to get very sick, they lose weight, weight, and they can die within one to two weeks of getting this disease. This has caused, uh, particularly in Asia, it's caused a lot of problems. China has had a slaughter uh, almost 100 million pigs due to African swine fever. It's affected uh, the Philippines as well. They're losing $20, $20 million a month. It's pushing bacon prices up worldwide as well. Now, uh, you can see this here in this chart that, uh, that of all the countries, this is um, percent uh, pork production per country. China is the biggest pork producer in the world. About 48% of all pork is produced in China. The EU and the US are next. And a lot of these countries here in the uh, kind of the stripes have uh, African swine fever being present, right? So that means they, ha they, don't, they don't have to kill all their pigs per se, but they do end up culling a lot of them and not being able to use the meat or not being able to use them for breeding because they don't want to they they spread it. Uh, luckily, here in the US, we haven't been affected yet, in Brazil as well, but uh, it's a huge source of concern. Cultivated meat, cultured meat can uh, fight this because we won't be raising the animals themselves, so we won't have to deal with antibiotics or with the uh, African swine fever that can be spread from animal to animal so easily. Okay, so um, we know uh, what cultured meat is. We know uh, one reason, a couple reasons why to use it to improve the environment, to prevent uh, diseases like African swine fever, to prevent antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria going on. But why now? Why 2019? Well, uh, 100 years ago, over 100 years ago now, 1917, the uh, first Myo tubes, the first skeletal muscle, were cultured in a dish by a German scientist. He took a chick embryo and he was able to culture muscle in the dish. Over 100 years ago, we could grow muscle in the dish. Um, but that's not sufficient. It's a very small amount and it didn't live very long. Back in 1931, Winston Churchill had this quote that everyone in the uh, field loves to uh, repeat, saying that in 50 years hence from now, 1931, I think I believe that was the title of the uh, magazine he wrote, in 50 years hence, that they're not going to grow the entire uh, chicken to enjoy chicken breast or chicken top thigh. You'll just, enjoy, you'll just grow the chicken breast or chicken thigh in these large vats. So Churchill was a little prescient on that, but a little too early. Uh, back in 1961, they discovered the stem cell that gave rise to muscle, skeletal muscle in the adult. It's called the satellite cell. All of our muscle fibers have numerous satellite cells on them. And whenever you're injured or have a muscle injury at all, these satellite cells become active, they proliferate, and then they're able to regenerate your injury. If your injury is too big, the satellite cells can't do it. But for any like, smaller injuries, the satellite cells can, can uh, proliferate and heal. So, so they're also responsible for growing. So as you go from a baby, to an adult, these satellite cells are responsible for adding all that muscle mass because uh, the muscle cells themselves are post-mitotic, they can't divide, they require these stem cells. So this is important because we need to get these stem cells to be able to grow the muscle in the dish. Back in 19, flash forward in 1995, a, uh, I believe a Dutch, uh, Dutchman uh, had put a patent on the consumption of cultured meat, just the uh, uh, idea and scale of it. Uh, that patent has since expired, but it, has expi but it inspired people, for, for example, in the, the uh, 90s for NASA to help um, put some grants out there to be uh, able to cultivate meat in space for astronauts, because you can't bring a you're not going to bring a cow onto a, uh, a spaceship or a pig. <laughs> it's just going to take up too much space, and it's going to be very hard for them to keep the, keep that animal alive. Uh, what they did was they uh, gave a, they have, I believe, a prize or um, funding to make uh, cultured meat, cultivated meat in space. And one of the things that someone did was, uh, not in space per se, but on Earth, they were able to take part of a goldfish out, not the individual cells, but they cut out part of a goldfish's, um, I think, uh, part of the fin muscle and part of the other parts of the goldfish. And they were able to grow a little bit of the muscle from the stem cells that came with it. And they were able to flay it up and be able to eat this goldfish. So this is a part of the goldfish. This is part of the first cultured meat, which was goldfish back in 2002. There's a paper on it. Uh, flash forward again, 2013, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, Sergey Brin from Google uh, decided to uh, spend money, uh, donate money to a fund to make the first cultured meat burger. Mark Post was one of those involved and what they did back in 2013 was they were able to uh, grow up about 200 gram uh, beef patties 
and they made uh, burgers out of it. The patties themselves were colorless, so they had to add a, like, uh, I think, beet or radish dye to it to make it a red color, otherwise it looks kind of gross. But these burgers cost about, they estimated about 200, 200, sorry, 225,000 pounds at, for, per patty, so that's not gonna work out right. It's obviously, and I heard, I heard about this when I was early in grad school, and I thought it was a, just a publicity stunt, right? Because no one's gonna pay this much. They wanted to fund this to help kind of uh, look at alternatives to fight climate change, uh, like what we, what we showed before, we can reduce the greenhouse gas, gas emissions of cultured meat. And I thought it was just, again, a publicity stunt. However, two years later, the first uh, cultured meat company, as far as I know, Memphis Meats, was founded here in uh, San Francisco. They went through an accelerator called Indie Bio, which is less than a mile away from here. And they, uh, Uma and uh, Nicholas, the founders made a uh, cultured meat meatball from beef throughout the program, and then they've gone on to, uh, to uh, grow quite a bit, go through a Series A and whatnot. And they, they really showed that people are willing to invest in this field. Um, that's one of the reasons why I started paying even more, even more of a close attention to this, because, well, if the investors are back in this, if another company started popping up as well, people are believing in this and, uh, you know, this potential there. So this is all well and good, but really, you know, really why now, right? I just told you a little story. What's changed from 1917 to today that we can say we can grow these vast amounts of meat, right? Because we could culture muscle in 1917, but uh, we didn't have cultured meat then. One, technology. Uh, when I say technology, I mean things like bioreactors. This is an example of a bioreactor, it's just a big vat. Uh, people have been able to grow uh, microbes and bioreactors, fermentation reactors for a long time. You go to a brewery, you see those, uh, um, those large tanks, you've got yeast growing them in them, making, helping to make beer. Uh, you've got a lot of com farmers companies that will grow uh, microbes or uh, um, other uh, uh, microbes, yeast and bacteria so that they can generate certain molecules for it. But also in the late 80s, early 90s, the first mammalian cells were grown in here, right? So when you grow yeast or bacteria, they tend to be pretty hardy and they can grow in suspension. That's not too much of a problem. But mammalian cells are much, more, are much different than that. They don't like to be in suspension for the, most, for the most part, depending on what cell you have, and they don't want to be in these larger reactors. But again, in the late 80s, late early 90s, they grew these Chinese hamster ovary cells, Cho cells, and suspension at high densities. And these Cho cells were very uh, much manipulated and very hardy. They're very special cells, but they're able to harvest uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies from them. And from these monoclonal antibodies, they can use these to treat various diseases. Um, so that's definitely a, uh, a huge game changer in terms of being able to grow mammalian cells in these large bioreactors. But also things like, this is CRISPR here, this is kind of a diagram of CRISPR and, uh, and the red here. And CRISPR and other genetic engineering techniques make it a lot easier to edit cells genetically, whether it means knocking out DNA or inserting DNA. And if you can do that, if you can manipulate the DNA, you can kind of control how the cell behaves. You can make it you can make it proliferate more. You can make it more adaptable to suspension culture. Like I said, a lot of mammalian cells like to stick to something, but if you can manipulate it or grow it in a certain way, you can make it float around a little better and be more amenable to growing in tanks like this. And again, you can make it so that you control when the cell divides, when it makes fat, or when it makes muscle. Uh, up to public consciousness, right? So uh, I'll talk about this in a little bit here, but people are... Uh, when you, ever, when you have a new thing in the market, you're never going to know if people are going to accept it or not. Like new Coke, right? Is that, was, that a, was that a winner or a loser? It was a loser. Crystal Pepsi as well. But then you have things like Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger that show that people are willing to buy these plant-based meat, you know, these meat alternatives, and not just vegetarians, but other people as well. And oftentimes they'll pay a premium. If you go to Burger King and get the Impossible Whopper, it's like, I believe a dollar or two dollars more than the regular Whopper. So this really bodes well for the cultivated meat industry. And the third issue is uh, price, which I, I'm sorry to say we haven't quite solved yet. <laughs> but uh, that's gonna be our last, one of the last hurdles that we need to do. So um, again, the Google Burger and the Edible Goldfish were really the first proofs of concept of this, but uh, I have to rep their company a little bit. <laughs> so our proof of concept was um, back in, about, about a year ago now, before I joined, uh, our two co-founders had a uh, tasting of about 40 people to um, of sausage, breakfast sausage. This is Jesse the pig, and they were to take a small biopsy of, of when Jesse from Jesse 
from uh, I know some um, Jesse was knocked out under the supervision of a vet. They took a small biopsy from his belly, from her belly, excuse me. They rushed back to lab. They grew up those cells many, many times, and they were able to differentiate them into muscle and fat cells. And from those muscle and fat cells, they harvested them, and then they worked with a sausage maker, and they made these sausages, three sausages, right? That's not much. This is it. This is it. This is three sausages they got from, uh, from so many cells. And this isn't even 100% meat. This is about 20 to 25% as meat. The rest is um, extender. Um, uh, English, uh, it was an English-style breakfast sausage as well. So it took months of work. Numerous things called tea flasks. Tea flasks are uh, exactly what they sound. They're flasks that can be like 75 or 182 centimeters squared, maybe this big, this big, the cells grow on the bottom. But it took, it took almost 100 of them to generate just 25% of mass for these sausages of cultured meat and uh, cultured fat. So that implies that uh, there's a lot of work to do, but this is, as a proof of concept, it works, right? And again, here's where the sausage has been cooked up, they look pretty good. Um, <laughs> what else is out there? When I say out there, I mean I have it in quotes because you cannot buy any cultured meat product yet. You can't go to any grocery store, you can't go to any uh, restaurant, no one has it out. Maybe if you work for one of the companies or try to uh, yeah. cozy up with one of them, you get the sample. But here's Memphis Meats, that first company I told you about. This is, I believe, a duck breast, a spread of duck breast in their cultured meat. I believe they say it's, a, I want to say it's 100% cultured meat, but I don't know. Just, also in San Francisco, has a chicken nugget that they worked on. This is from a news program. Aleph Farms, actually an Israeli company, they have uh, what they claim to be these mini steaks, so that they're a uh, they're more structured than any ground any ground product. And they already had a tasting last December on it. Um, seafood is also really big in the cultured meat field because uh, sustainability issues in terms of these large uh, fish, like bluefin tuna. Also, there's a much higher um, margin in terms of uh, a profit uh, versus a uh, commodity meat like pork or chicken. Um, wild type, based in San Francisco again. They had a tasting of salmon in Portland earlier this year. That's their salmon on top of where uh, people said they liked it. Uh, Finless Foods, they uh, focus on bluefin tuna. And I think these are, these are uh, patties that they made uh, at the end of their program in Indie Bio. And Shiok Meats, which is based in Singapore, they had the first tasting of uh, cultured shrimp meat. Now, shrimp are a uh, huge uh, farming, or done shrimp done in Southeast Asia, uh, but there's a lot of pollution associated with shrimp farms. They can generate a ton of waste to make it out of this shrimp. So they're working on that particular product. Uh, worldwide, what we're looking at is the Bay Area loves, the Bay Area loves these cultured meat companies. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, based in the Bay Area. It's Blue Nalu, which again focuses on tuna. They're based in San Diego. Uh, Fork and Good and Lamp Farm Foods are based in the East Coast near New York. There's one in South America. Europe has quite a bit here too. Uh, Mosa Meats, that's Mark Post's, uh, 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 Mark Post's company in the Netherlands, he made the Google Burger. You have is Israel is also focused on uh, cultured meat, future meats, uh, Ela Farms, Super Meat. And you have a couple of them in Asia here. You got Integra Culture, based in Japan. Avant uh, Meats, based in Hong Kong, they had, I believe, some seafood recently of uh, a tasting. And Shiak Meats in Singapore, and then one that we very recently in, ba in um, Australia called Val. I believe their first product was going to be a kangaroo meat of some sort. Do we have anything in the United States? I noticed that the book hmm? line is blank. Oh, this is, this is all the U.S. here. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but I mean, uh, this, this is just everybody but the U.S.? Yeah. No, this, this, is, this is all the U.S. companies right here, but they're all like in the Bay Area, so I kind of oh, put, okay. put them there. And then these two are in the U.S. as well. Lab Farm Foods and Pork and Good. So the majority of the companies are based in the U.S. And most of them are in the Bay Area as well. Um, so one of the challenges, like I said, uh, we got some things done, but there are a lot of challenges ahead before cultured meat can actually come to the market. One of them is uh, fetal bovine serum, which I'll talk about in a moment. Another is controlling cells. How do you control when a cell proliferates versus when it makes muscle or fat? When a cell makes muscle or fat, the adult tissue, it's done dividing. It can no longer, it can no longer make copies of itself, and it can only just hang out as muscle or fat cells. So that means you have to make sure the cell, you have a high enough density before you can make a muscle or fat. Immortalized cells, every time a cell divides, 
it, this mutation happens in humans and in culture, right? Uh, in, in vitro, we have ways to deal with this, but, or sorry, in vivo, in the body, we have ways to deal with this, but in cell culture, not as much, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Again, scaling up, which is gonna be the biggest issue going from a 2D dish to a 3D suspension culture. And again, the holy grail here, the three-dimensional tissue with a nice thick steak, organized, large, and tasty. Uh, but again, the biggest challenge is price, getting the cost down. Okay, so FBS, so fetal bovine serum is exactly what it sounds like. Every year, uh, every time a cow is slaughtered, or I should say, uh, out of all the cows slaughtered every year, a small percentage, about eight of them, are pregnant at the time of slaughter. And farmers typically don't know that because you don't want to kill a pregnant cow since you could get the calf and then have the next generation of cows and so forth, but about 8% of them. And uh, what happens when they, found, when they find a pregnant cow that is um, slaughtered, they're able to take the serum from the fetus at different stages by, uh, um, by doing puncturing, I believe, the, cow, the calf's heart and collecting it. Then they spin it down, they get rid of all the cells, and they combine a bunch of it. And this fetal bovine serum, they get about 800,000 liters a year from about 2 million bovine fetuses. Pardon me for the uh, cutoff there. And this is what cells love. The fetal bovine serum has, is very rich in things called growth factors. These are proteins that uh, encourage cells to grow and to proliferate. And they are uh, very also rich in things like trace metals, lipids, vitamins, and minerals, right? Now, uh, this is it right here. It's kind of a brownish, orangish color. And back in the 50s, or maybe even earlier, they found that this fetal bovine serum was great for growing cells in culture. Uh, typically, you have 10 or 20 percent of your culture media is composed of fetal bovine serum. Um, however, there's a lot of drawbacks to using it. One, you know, it comes from a, a fetal calf, and again, this is only about 8 percent of cows at the time of slaughter are going to have a fetal calf, and it's also terrible for animal welfare if you care about that. But also, there's uh, high variability. When I mean high variability, I mean one lot of fetal bovine serum can be Quite, a, quite different from another lot of fetal bovine serum. When I was in grad school, we tried to buy uh, liters of this at a time, so that when we did our experiments, we were using the same batch of fetal bovine serum. And whenever we used a new one, we'd have to do comparisons between a new one and old one because they could influence how the cells behave. So this can change the scientific results that you get. Uh, also, it's also very expensive. It's about $1,000 a liter of this. And this can change based upon the uh, cattle production every year, about 500000 uh, leaders are sold every year, uh, not quite all of them that are made, they're sold. But it can also harbor diseases, things like prion disease or um, whatever else the cows may have at the time of slaughter can be harvested in this. And this is not going to be useful for cultured meat because one, it depends upon slaughtered animals, two, high variability, three, high price. So we cannot use this for cultured meat. Uh, thankfully, there are alternatives to this. A lot of them tend to be very expensive still because you have to have, you still have to have those particular growth factor proteins that can be, that can be made from things like bacteria or yeast. Uh, but again, it's still pretty pricey. Uh, but fetal bovine serum is only part of what you feed the cells. So when you feed them this, this nutrient rich, rich broth, this culture media, the rest of it, 80% of it is not the FBS. 80% of it's gonna be sugars like glucose, amino acids that the cells need to make uh, proteins. Uh, different types of proteins and growth factors, vitamins, lipids, fatty acids that the cells need to, make, to uh, generate their membrane and what have you, and different trace elements that certain proteins are re required to have to act to, uh, to work. This is a super large space that we have to explore because FBS itself has about 400 plus components in it. The rest of this uh, particular culture medium, basal medium, will have about 60 to 70 components. Not all of these components are necessary for these cells to grow and divide. So to get our cost down, and this is indeed the biggest cost, the culture media, you have to really explore what's necessary and what's sufficient for this that's going to keep the cells happy, healthy, and growing. And this is what most companies are working on right now because if you can't get this cost down, you can't be competitive with traditional animal agriculture. Another challenge here is cell fate. When I say cell fate, I mean um, you have a stem cell here on the left, this little round cell. And this adult stem cell has a choice. It's gonna, it can divide and make more of itself, but it's going to come to a point where it has to choose what kind of cell it wants to be. Uh, some of these cells are multipotent. I mean, that means they have different fates. Maybe it can become a mature fat cell, an adipocyte. Maybe it can become a connective tissue cell, a fibroblast. Or maybe it can become a, a muscle cell, a skeletal muscle cell, a myotube. 
And uh, being able to control this in culture can be very difficult because these cells respond to certain cues. In the body, you know, you can go from one cell, a single zygote, to a fully grown human, right? And that's a very well programmed and very uh, well influenced uh, um, uh, uh, landscape. However, in culture, you don't all have all the cues that you have in the, in the body or in the fetus or in the in utero. You have to actually add these cues via the pH or adding these particular proteins or small molecules, and you have to add them at a particular time. Because some, sometimes stem cells will go down one path, but you don't want to go down the path. So by the time, so you have to give it something else to make it muscle or fat. And uh, you can see here these are actual images of cells. These are stem cells here, these little round cells. Sometimes they become bipolar. And then they, these ones can actually become these muscle tubes. These are muscle cells in culture. They're very big, they're very long. Uh, in culture, sometimes they contract randomly as well, just like your skeletal muscle contracts. And here we have some fat cells here, these little globular ones. These are mature fat cells. So you have to be able to control what these cells are going to become muscle cells or they're going to become fat cells via how you add stuff to the culture or genetically as well. Tucker? Nick, do you mind questions during your talk? Uh, you wait? Sure, you can ask some questions if you want. Did you just say those muscle, muscle tissues randomly and spontaneously contract? Yeah, so in culture, because they lack the control that they do in, uh, in the body, they can randomly contract. They'll still stay in the plate, but sometimes if, if it's not attached well, they can come off right off the plate and they'll be kind of floating around. Walk away. Uh, <laughs> not so much walk, but uh, float away, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and actually that's one thing in the cultured meat field is we can actually, if, we, if we're able to grow these muscles, because this is kind of random, right? In the body, all the, muscle cell, all the muscle cells are going the same direction. That's why you can be able to contract and move around. In culture, unless you have a certain design in your wells, they're going to grow, go randomly here. This is going this way, that one's going that way. And when you do have certain, like a certain groove that they can grow into, then you can exercise those muscles in vitro by either stretching them out or by giving them electrical signals. So you can actually work out cultured muscles <laughs> in a certain way. Uh, not so much for the fat cells, they just kind of hang out, but the muscle cells are... Um, there go. Uh, so another, uh, again, one of the challenges is immortalizing cells. So um, what happens typically, again, we have these stem cells, these small round ones. Uh, eventually, they're going to get to a point where they can stop dividing. It's called the Hayflick limit. It's about 60 divisions. Uh, six cells can divide 60 times. Um, and depending on the cell type, sometimes less. What happens is they get to a point where the DNA, uh, the DNA is either mutated or the telomeres, the end caps of DNA are all worn off, and they become senescent. And what does that mean? Uh, that means they stop dividing and they stop doing their job. So this big, kind of looks like a fried egg here. There's a nucleus right there. As bright as a senescent cell. It doesn't do its job anymore and it doesn't uh, divide anymore. But it's still alive. The cell is still alive. It's still, um, it's not dead. It's not apoptotic. It's not necrotic. But it's just senescing. It's just hanging out. It doesn't do its job anymore. And that's just a limit, a natural limit of cells, especially in culture. Now, um, in order to avoid that, we have to do either go back to the animal every time we want to get more cells because, again, there's only so many divisions we can do, and you have to go from a small plate to a large bioreactor, or we have to immortalize the cells. Now, people have been immortalizing cells for quite some time, usually um, not knowing it. Have you guys familiar with uh, HeLa cells, Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks? Those are immortalized cells. Those are tumor cells. Uh, but they're immortalized. Those cells are going to go forever. Those have been going from the 50s, uh, those cells. But other cells uh, can also become immortalized spontaneously. What do I mean by that? Well, like I said, every time you have a cell in a, in a dish, every time a division happens, mutations happen in the DNA. Your DNA, human DNA, is about 3 billion base pairs, right? So uh, every division, uh, the rate of mutation, which I can't remember off the top of my head, so many base pairs are going to be mutated. Most of the time, that's going to be fine for the cells because most of the DNA... Um, I won't say isn't important, but isn't necessary for the cell to keep dividing and growing and doing its job. However, certain times you're going to get random mutations that cause spontaneous immortalization. And what do I mean by that? I mean a mutation in a particular gene that causes the cell to ignore senescence and keep dividing and dividing and dividing. And people, if you go online to uh, certain cell line bank companies or uh, organizations, they have cells that have been spontaneously immortalized. There's a particular line of mouse cells, mouse uh, muscle cells, stem cells, that were immortalized spontaneously in the 70s, and they keep dividing and dividing and dividing, but they also make muscle, right? Those are immortalized cells. They're not tumor cells, but they're immortal, right? Because they can still make muscle and they can still divide and make themselves. What we have to do in the industry is either use spontaneously immortalized cells, meaning that 
randomly a mutation happened in the dish and that gave rise to the cells you want that still make themselves and still make muscle, or we have to do it via a uh, genetic engineering. And we know certain loci that we can um, manipulate to make cells immortal, like uh, the tel uh, telomerase enzyme. If we make that um, super strong, it can make cells immortal in, con in conjunction with other things as well. But we also have to be able to control uh, when the cell is going to divide, right, in the previous slide. So we don't want to make immortal cells tumor cells, because tumor cells aren't going to make muscle or fat. We want to make immortalized cells that will still make muscle and fat. So that's going to probably require uh, genetic engineering. But again, spontaneous mutations are also possible. And uh, again, uh, 3D tissue. So when I say 3D tissue, I mean this like thick steak, right? This is the holy grail. Now if you were to look closely at this steak, if you were to take sections of it, like cross sections of it like this, you're going to see this tissue here. This, this is the skeletal muscle tissue. These polygonal shapes are individual muscle fibers, you know, the ones that run along the, uh, the length of the muscle. These dark spots are nuclei. These skeletal muscles are, uh, the skeletal fibers are multinucleated. This is a very well organized tissue, nice and tightly packed. Probably have some vasculature going through some of these places as well, and nerves as well. And if you look at, again, if you look at the steak, it's super well organized. Now, um, with the exception of Aleph Farms, which made these really thin uh, muscle dish, excuse me, steaks, um, most people are going to focus on ground product because it's so much easier to grow up the individual muscle fibers and fat, and then ground it all up and mix it up together at the end. But eventually, we'd love to be able to make a nice thick steak. It doesn't have to be necessarily this level of structure and organization. Uh, but it just has to be something that approximates that tastes good and is made up of, uh, of muscle and fat. But again, this is super hard to do. People have been working on tissue engineering for decades. And the biggest thing they can grow in, in culture right now is nowhere near this. It's, it's very, very small. Uh, but in the culture meat field, we don't have the same constraints because we're not going to make something that, to transplant into a person. Like if you have a large muscle injury, you need something that's going to be look a lot like this and going to be uh, able to be transplanted into you. We are just going to eat it, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be this level of structure and organization, but it needs to approximate it good enough so that we can, it tastes like it, it gives you a good experience. And uh, uh, scaling up, finally scaling up, right? So this is from uh, Mark Posts when he made that Google Burger, 100 grams. These are 10 layer flasks, right? Each, each flask has 10 new layers. And every layer, there's cells growing on it. This kind of red stuff is the media in there. And he had to have numerous, numerous of these 10, 10 level flasks to grow a couple hundred grams of burger, right? I think that's definitely not going to scale. And you have to have a tech, you know, take out the media every couple days and put new media in. That's not going to work when it comes to um, generating the metric tons of meat that we need. So we're going to have to go to, again, a bioreactor solution. There's solutions for mammalian cells. Again, Cho cells. I don't want to eat a Chinese hamster ovary cell. I don't know about you. But hopefully we can get the um, uh, uh, skeletal muscle precursors and fat precursors to grow in tanks like this. So we can take advantage of the large volume. And then we won't need a, per a couple techs you know, coming in every day to change the media. <laughs> A uh, couple, couple of other challenges, you know, we really need to make sure that we're giving people a good experience. If we grow up a lot of uh, muscle and fat that tastes bad, that's, we failed, right? People don't, we have to give people a good, a good experience at a good price that people will accept, which I'll talk about a little bit more. I mean, if people just want to try cultured meat once and like Instagram it and like, oh, I'm trying cultured meat and never try it again, again, that would be a failure for the, for the uh, field. And then we have to deal with regulation, uh, not just GMOs per se, but um, regulation of cultured meat in general. Um, with that, let me just talk a little bit about the current state of the industry. These next couple of charts were made by Elias Schwartz, uh, who's at, he's at the Good Food uh, Institute. He does a lot of good writing on cultured meat and cultivated meat. Uh, back in 20, this is uh, money raised, and this is the year. This is money raised is almost completely from venture funds, I believe. And back in 2015, only uh, Memphis Meats was raising money. Uh, 2016, they have uh, future. Um, what's that? I'm having trouble distinguishing the color. Uh, Meatable, I think, it's like they're like raising money. Memphis Meats had their uh, Series A in uh, 2017. They raised about $10 million. In 2018, you see a lot of bunch of companies are joining as well. In 2019, even more. This is what I showed you that map. New Age Meats here, we've actually raised about two, uh, almost $3 million. It's not reflected on this map because we haven't announced it yet. But uh, you can see we're about $70 million just in 2019 alone have been, has been raised in the cultured meat field. And it's a slew of um, seafood and uh, uh, terrestrial livestock as well. Um, 
Again, most of this has been done through uh, venture funding. Most of these companies have got their seed funding. Seed funding typically is about a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, and then a lot of companies this year have got, gone through their Series A for 10 to 20 million dollars as well. Wild type, focusing on the salmon. Um, Shiok meats, focusing on the, uh, uh, I think they got actually uh, last year, uh, focusing on shrimp and so forth and so on. Um, what does Alice Farms make? Uh, they made that little steak oh, in Israel. Okay. Uh, but they're still trying to make, it was about a couple millimeters thick, if I remember correctly. Actually, uh, maybe a centimeter thick, excuse me, mm -hmm. or two. Uh, but it's actually impressive for what people can do with tissue engineering. Um, but again, California dominates in the U.S. in terms of all the companies stationed here, raising so much money. Israel, the companies, Ala Farms, Super Meat, Future, Future Meat as well. And then uh, Spain and the Netherlands are leading uh, European investment. And again, if you want to see this again, you can go to L.H. Schwartz's Twitter account, if I believe he has this up posted there. And then uh, finally, in these graphs, you can see that uh, most of the money is going to be, it's kind of a tie between livestock, uh, cow and pig, and seafood. Uh, some companies are focusing on uh, poultry, like super meat in Israel. Other companies are focusing just on fat. Mission Barnes, which is based in Berkeley or Emeryville, and uh, Cubic uh, Foods, which is based in Spain, are focusing just on making fat cells, not the muscle cells themselves. Um, and then we, some people we don't know what they're working on, but most of it's on <laughs> livestock and uh, seafood. Um, again, seafood might run out in terms of investment because there's so much more uh, profitability, profitability in seafood. You can charge a lot more for bluefin tuna than you can for a hamburger, as well as uh, there's a good argument in seafood in terms of sustainability that we can't uh, 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 we can't ramp up seafood production without, you know, draining the stocks of salmon or uh, cod or uh, bluefin tuna. Uh, regulatory status, what's going on in the U.S.? Um, well, the U.S. as a whole just very recently determined last, uh, late last year, early this year, that the FDA and USDA will jointly regulate the cultured meat field. The FDA is going to regulate it from the beginning, early start, so cell collection, making cell banks, growing up the cells and differentiate them. At the point of cell harvest, which I'm not 100% certain, no, no, certain what it means, but I imagine it means that when you take it from the bioreactors and actually do food science and food processing on it, the USDA, USDA will take over the uh, Food Safety Inspection Service. They're going to look at the production and labeling of human food products. And this is typically how, the, uh, um, uh, how it works in the regular uh, traditional food as well. Um, Interesting to note though that the FDA uh, regulates seafood minus catfish, which for whatever reason the USDA regulates, and the FDA was only, I believe will be regulating themselves just the seafood products, whereas the poultry livestock will be having this joint regulation on it. What about uh, individually the states? Well, the states aren't as happy about cultured meat as the federal government is. Uh, these states in blue, there has been legislature either uh, passed or proposed that lab, um, making meat labeling laws, not only against cultured meat, but against things like Beyond Meat and Impossible Meat. They are uh, very concerned that the consumers might be fooled by um, labeling laws and, or by uh, mislabeled items. So they want to make it illegal to um, label cultured meat or uh, plant-based meat as meat in the supermarket. And this is the uh, example of the summary of the Mississippi law, which went into effect uh, just very recently. Under the new law, companies cannot label a product meat unless it's in the carcasses or parts thereof of cattle, sheep, goats, other ruminants. Under the new law, any food product containing cell cultured animal taste, animal tissue, or plant based or insect based food should not be labeled as meat or a meat product. Violation is up to one year in prison, which is, seems like a lot, or a, a fine of $1,000. Or up, or maybe including a fine of $1,000. So Mississippi passed a law, Missouri passed a law. I believe Montana and the Dakotas have passed laws. Other states, I'm not certain of. I think maybe they just went up to vote. But there's a lot of pushback in these states, mostly because of um, a lot of times these states are very, uh, uh, very dependent upon animal livestock, like the Cattlemen's Association or the, or, uh, the pork industry in a lot of these states as well are, are fairly big. Um, there's some uh, company, there's some nonprofits in the uh, culture and alternative meat space, like the Good Food Institute, that's kind of pushing back and trying putting up, opening up lawsuits against these, but to a uh, mixed success. Um, what do you guys think? You guys think it should be labeled, or should not be labeled as meat, cultured meat, or plant-based meats? If you go to the supermarket, 
you get a possible burger, do you want it to be labeled, so not say meat at all on it? No. I want it to say what it is. What, what, what they said plant-based meat, would that be okay? Yeah, I yeah. Yeah. Just, 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 just be honest and open. Just mark it. How about cultured meat? Yes. I don't think people will buy it if it has to say that. <coughs> I don't want to know all the, like, I don't want to know how stuff is processed all the time, even though I'm trying to be, you know, a good purchaser, you know? So I think, um, I don't know, you know, as far as people have to educate themselves, I'm not sure that it's the government's business to, to label every single thing. You know what I mean? It's like we, we assume it's safe if it's mm-hmm. all trees that it's trees. There's, I don't know. I don't really have an experience about it. Well, you have to label it something that people understand that yeah. it's different from. Right. But it's not the same. Oh, it should be like, like, like natural, natural organic. organic. You know, mm-hmm. Remember that thing went on for years and years. And, yeah, but that's not a stretch. How about sort of words like beef or chicken or pork? There are standards of identity that they currently have. Uh, the FDA currently has about labeling certain things. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there's certain percentages of a product that you have to have uh, to be able to label it like chicken wings versus, I think Tyson had chicken wings like W, Y, and Z or something that was, had a certain percentage of chicken. Beef, you know, that's maybe a way to get away from the meat. Oh, you mean uh, that? I'm, that I'm not certain of. That's a good point. I don't, I don't know if you can call it just cultured pork. Yeah. Um, but does it meat does or it meat product? I don't know. It might be more specific than the actual text of the law. Actually, that law says unless it's the carcass, it sort of dissuades you from eating it to begin with. Eating any meat. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, 46% would pay, uh, uh, so forth. Prior research said about 32% would need, but this is back to they learned about the uh, benefits of it. And that the best pr promotional message that people could, that you could do for this is that, excuse me, is, is claiming that conventional meat is un, quote unquote, un, unnatural. I don't know how I feel about that, but this is just a consumer survey they did. Uh, another consumer survey found something different though. Um, they found that a lot of people agreed, this is from a, a recent paper this year, that the US, and F, USDA and FDA uh, should prohibit the use of the word beef on the labels for lab grown meat. They found that uh, a lot of people again agree with the USDA and FDA should prohibit the use of beef on the labels for like Beyond Meat or an Impossible Burger and so forth. So, so they found a lot of support for these labeling laws up and down the field. And they also found in this particular paper uh, of this year that um, if you were given a ch if people were given the choice of, at a comparable price point between cultured meat, uh, plant based plant meat, uh, plant based meat, whether it's from pea protein or yeast, and traditional beef, that the vast majority of people, which at a comparable price point, would choose conventional beef in this particular survey, kind of con contradicts the previous survey. Uh, what I say to this is that we won't really know until it actually comes out in the market and what people are willing to pay for it and w willing to accept it. Um, you know, maybe for uh, their surveys about uh, Impossible Burger or, or the Beyond Meat Burger that people wouldn't pay anything for it, but now they're fairly successful. Maybe the truth, maybe the truth, same thing will be true about cultured meat. Maybe it won't, but we have to release it to the market to find out what if people are going to accept it or not. Uh, but when's it going to be in the market? I don't know. People, people have claimed that uh, two years ago or uh, 2018 has been in the market. It wasn't. People claim this year hasn't been. Uh, maybe next year, maybe 10 years. I wouldn't be surprised either way. I know some companies are a little further along than others. We are not as far along. It would probably be two to three years before we would be ready for market. Other companies like Memphis Meats or Just have been around for longer. They're much bigger than us. They've raised a lot more money. So they might be uh, maybe on the market this year, maybe next year. I don't know. Um, but what do we need as the industry matures in terms of work, uh, to work in this space? Well, we have a lot of scientists currently, uh, cell and molecular biologists, geneticists, food and meat scientists, engineers as we start to grow up because as we scale up, we're going to need to have um, uh, people who can do process engineering, organizing these large vats, knowing when to change the media. But we also need business people in terms of people who will work with uh, um, the government and regulations to make sure that we're developing a safe product that people will accept and that is acceptable in a, a current uh, a regulatory environment and you know marketing and the rest of the business people. I don't quite know what they do because I'm not on that side but uh, I'm sure we need them. <laughs> so just to show that I'm not a cultured meat maniac, uh, there's a bunch of alternative proteins out there. Uh, things like the plant-based meat like the Impossible Burger here and the Beyond Burger. I've had both of them. They're not bad. They're much better than the veggie burgers of uh, the 90s and early 2000s. We also have edible insects. At least here in the um, U.S. and, and uh, Western countries, uh, insects aren't consumed as much as other countries, but they are a different protein source that is consumed many places around the world, whether it's uh, insects as whole or whether it's the actual grinding out the powder of the insects and harvesting their um, proteins or just the powdered crickets and what have you or mealworms to make in a flower. You have uh, a, a whole field called cellular agriculture of, of which cultured meat is only a part. Cellular agriculture is uh, making uh, animal based products in vitro. So whether that's a milk or uh, egg whites or meat, you can all these all these companies perfect day which is made casein, which is a main component of milk. Uh, you got New Culture, which is making uh, casein, among other proteins, and making cheese out of it. Not from a cow, per se, but from microbes that can make these particular proteins, and then using food science can make these products. And again, Clear Foods, is, which is making egg whites. Um, if you want to know more about these particular uh, fields of cellular agriculture or cultured meat, these, these organizations are very helpful. New Harvest, Good, Good, Foods, Good Food Institute, they're two nonprofits that focus a lot on New Harvest More Cell Ag. Good food, mo good food, mostly cultured meat and animal uh, and plant-based meat alternatives. You also have the Cultured Meat Future Food podcast hosted by Alex, who's actually hosting the uh, Cultured Meat Symposium later this year. As a blog called Cultured Abundance, that's very informative, written by Robert Yaman, whom uh, I, I, I know of. Uh, he's working at Mission Barnes now, but he does some good work on this. And also uh, Cell Agri, which I got the name cut off there, which also focuses on uh, cellular agriculture. But these are all online sources that you can search, and it'll tell you more about the field. 
And then again, I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank the library, uh, Leah and Tucker, Wonderfest. I want to thank the Bay Area Science Festival. Um, this is our team here at New Age Meets. We're only four people, and we are hiring, so maybe we can throw this picture, picture of you on the next presentation. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank science, too, because I very much enjoy learning about the world and uh, trying to make it better. So I'll take any other questions you may have. Thank you. Yes, in front. You mentioned that money is a challenge. I mean, what sort mm -hmm. of things need to happen to bring the cost down? So the media conditions, right? The media is crazy expensive right now. Even about FBS, having those, uh, uh, even a couple of proteins called growth factors can be very expensive. And being able to generate them in a very large volume that we need for these 10,000 liter, 50,000 liter reactors, that really needs to come down. In addition to that, but also the amino acids, the sugars, finding the right amount of each that we need so we're not putting too much in or too little in. Um, and also the sources. So most of what's done uh, when you talk about these big bioreactors is for pharma. So they have very high standards because this is going to be used for medicine for people, right? So you have to have very, very large amounts of quality control. We're going to eat our product, right? So we have to have good quality control, but not necessarily up to here because we're not. This isn't going to be given to some sick person. It just needs to be healthy and safe enough to eat, not necessarily to transplant, to inject or to uh, get into your bloodstream. Um, so we have maybe find alternative sources of these products. So for example, like glucose, instead of having the uh, purified product, maybe we have molasses, right? And we buy a bunch of molasses one year, mm -hmm. and we get as much glucose as much as, as we want from there, as opposed to having like super high quality controlled glucose that they use for our traditional cultured media. Um, so yeah, that's probably our biggest, biggest almost every company's biggest focus right now is getting the culture media cost down. In the back. Mm -hmm. Oh uh, no! So you, you take it from an adult. Uh, so we can take the, you can take the stem cell from the adult as opposed to the fetus. The fetus uh, we take the serum from the fetus when you have fetal bovine serum. But we have alternatives to that now. 